The only thing that we're interested in is putting money in your wallet. If you want to bet the fights, if you want to have a little bit of action, you are in the right place. With my partner, Ian Parker, I am Bretto Komodo. We're ready to rock between our parlays, our props, our straight picks. It's time to make money. Let's go. Well, it has arrived. One of the biggest fight weeks of the 2022 calendar. You're looking at Abu Dhabi, which will serve host to UFC 280 with a main event vacant lightweight title fight between Charles Oliveira and Islam Makachev. We have been expecting an Islam Makachev title fight basically since Habib walked away from the sport two years ago. We will get it this weekend at UFC 280 and it comes against a man that I don't think anybody really wants to bet against in Charles Oliveira. We'll see if if uh, Ian Parker has uh, the um, the gumption to pick against Charles Oliveira after he has proved us wrong so many times. Hello, everybody. I am Bruno Komodo. That is Ian Parker. We are going to be talking about UFC 280 from a betting standpoint. As always, it's good to have you back. And before we get into UFC 280, we are going to let uh, we're going to let Ian brag a little bit as he's as he's he's been bragging a lot lately. Hit the long shot parlay, and then what did we do uh, at UFC Fight Night on the last last time around, Ian? Well, last week we followed up that long shot with perfect sweep on best bets. We went 4-0. And even our parlay, we missed it with Victor Henry, the biggest favorite loss. So for those of you guys that pay attention, you follow the education of this show. If you did what we always talk about and hedge that last leg, you would have been profitable. So the parlay just missed, but best bets, 4-0, clean sweep. Let's carry it into this week. You're killing it, man. Killing it. No losses on that best bets. Love it when that happens. Let's do it again this week. And we got a really, really, of course, fun card to talk about, UFC 280. Let's take a look at the main card. Five fights, as always, on this pay-per-view. Um, and they're good ones. You know, it's going to open up with Caitlin Chukagan fighting Mano Fior. A lot of people excited about Fior. She's got a tough test ahead of her, as always, uh, in Caitlin Chukagan. Benil Dariush and Mateus Gamrod on the card. Sean O'Malley taking a big step up fighting Piotr Jan. He's the number one contender in that division, the number one ranked contender in that division. Al Jermaine Sterling looking to defend his title against TJ Dillashaw. And of course, the main event, Charles Oliveira versus Islam Makachev, technically for the vacant lightweight title, but I think we all look at Charles as the defending champion here. But as is often the case in his title reign, he is the underdog, plus 160 against Islam Makachev, minus 190. What do we think about a minus 190 handicap for Islam Makachev? <laughs> you know what? What's telling me is that the bookmakers are looking at that ground control, the top game, the IQ, his striking overall well-rounded. You know, he was dropped years ago by Adrian Martins. People may harp on that, but you're look, looking at a guy who, you know, there was just no one in front at the moment. Sometimes people get to skip the line, rightfully so. He's got that style that I think may cause Charles some problems. Yeah, what did you think about the, the actual size of the opening line? I, Islam Makachev has been a favorite in every single one of his fights. It's the longest streak, I believe, that, that, that has ever started a UFC career, being a favorite in every single one of those. He's a, a big-time favorite against a lot of these different fights in a lot of these different fights. Okay, so he's still got a couple to go here for Curtis Blades, but uh, he's going to get there if he wins this fight. Um, what did you think, what did you expect the line to be, Ian? And, and what was going through the odds makers' heads, I guess, when they're trying to figure out an appropriate line for this one? You know, for me, I, I honestly thought Islam was going to be a minus 150. I, I was hoping he would be around that number. You know, but then there are people who thought he should be minus 400 because you got a guy in Islam who knows how to strike. He knows how to disguise his takedowns. And once he gets you on the ground, not many, if any, have really figured out how to reverse, sweep, get out of that situation, and they get dominated. You know, someone in Charles Oliveira in his last three fights, we talk about this. You know, throw the whole quitting thing out the window. That stigma is gone because in his last three fights, he's been dropped each and every time and he's come back to win the biggest issue i have with that though is these fighters were kind of like timid to go to the floor with him worrying about his jujitsu skills now don't get me wrong he's world class possibly the best mma's ever had to see but he's not off his back where he does his best work is when he takes your back you know i don't see islam getting triangle choked or arm barred or even swept for that matter so unless charles is able to take the back of islam magachev if this fight goes to the floor, which I think it will, and if Islam drops him, I expect Islam to smother him once it gets there. 
How do you look at, at Charles right now? I mean, like you said, the heart is there. It, it, it's, almost, it's almost weird to, to think that we, we used to call this guy a quitter because now he has gone the complete opposite direction. And it feels like he's got more heart than anybody. But he has been in trouble. He has been dropped in multiple fights. Like, are we impressed by that? Because we're looking at this from a completely betting standard. When you're trying to, to figure out the value in him, uh, how are you kind of breaking, breaking it down and, and trying to find value in Charles Oliver when he is in trouble in, in all of his fights? You know, for me, you just got to look at his opponent because, you know, someone in Justin Gaethje, you don't see Gaethje going to the ground too much, even in top position. You know, Dustin Poirier was so comfortable with his boxing. You have someone in Islam Akachev here, though, is going to be happy to go to the ground with anyone. He is not afraid. Of and if he is on top, even someone like Charles Oliveira, he's not going to be able to sub him. Islam is too strong. He's too smart. He's too quick. You know, you want to say position over submission sometimes, then look what he did to Dan Hooker. Not that Hooker obviously possesses the same type of defensive Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu skills as Charles Oliveira. I think if Oliveira is too confident in his stand-up, there's only so many times you can get dropped and come back and get dropped and people allow you to recover. Islam's not that guy. Well, I'm getting a very strong sense that we're picking Islam in this fight, but are we taking him at minus 190? You're going to try and find a different way to bet this one. You know what? I don't mind the under three and a half play, but for me, I do like Islam to win this fight. You know, I love the minus 175 a couple of weeks ago. I would play him here at minus 190. You know, look, you're going to have people that are loving Charles at this number and people that are loving Islam at this number. I've heard things that Charles is going to do this and Islam is going to run through him here. For me, we talk about this all the time. Styles make fights. Again, if Islam drops him, he is going to go to the floor with him get into side mount, and that's where he's going to do damage. And he may even get the sub if you want to do a prop. So I am going to go Islam here at minus 190 and new on Saturday night. One real quick follow last question before we get to the co-main event with Islam. Who in the lightweight division would be the smallest underdog to him? If he's favored against every single one of the guys, who, who is the toughest fight in the division for him? Uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov. <laughs> you know, outside of that, for me, it, it's going to be really, right? Because you know what? When you're looking at, because if you're talking straight odds here, this may be it. After this, you know, because look, if Matus Gamrock goes out there and steamrolls Benil Dariush or gets a dominant win, you got to think that maybe he's next in line for a title shot or Alexander Volkanovsky, which has been the obvious one too, if they do go that direction. I'm curious to see what the line would be for Volkanovsky. If Islam goes in there and finishes Charles in one or two rounds, I think he'll be a two to one favorite minimum over the 145 pound champ in Volkanovsky. Yeah, that's that's wild, man. But it just shows you it just shows you the level of confidence that these odds makers have with Islam, just how good he's been so far in his UFC career. All right, let's get to the next band, uh, the next title fight here. It's Aljamain Sterling, TJ Dillashaw, 135 pounds. Ian, you can you can take this any way you want it. I'm, I'm curious to get your, your opening thoughts, but I got to say, for me, it just really comes down to how much confidence do you have that TJ Dillashaw is still TJ Dillashaw? Because if it's TJ Dillashaw that we got used to seeing, you know, years ago, winning the championship, defending it multiple times, getting finishes, stylistically, I think that you know it's it's kind of wild that this guy would be a plus 140 underdog to Aljamain Sterling, but. When you add everything that's taken place over the last three years, that's probably where you're getting this line. So for me, it's just which TJ Dillashaw are you going to get? Is he still that guy who was who was fighting three years ago? Is that what is your biggest kind of uh, perspective on this fight? You know, for me, I'm pretty impressed with TJ Dillashaw how he was able to come back and you know, granted the Corey Sanhagen fight was a back and forth. He did it on one knee, and we know how good Corey Sanhagen is. For me, this TJ Dillashaw fight truly has to be. How good is your takedown defense? Because you know that Al Jermaine Sterling is going to try and be a human backpack. That's how he beat Piotr Jan. It wasn't on the feet. It wasn't through the cardio. It was through the wrestling, but taking the back. That's how Al Joe gets it done. That's how he would win in this fight. But TJ's a good wrestler in his own right. He's a very good wrestler. His takedown defense has been pretty solid. You know, Al Joe doesn't necessarily disguise his takedowns all that much. He goes for that low ankle pick. We saw it against Piotr Jan. I think TJ, <coughs> excuse me, will be able to possibly fend that off and if he can i think the striking is very far apart in tj's favor i think that could be output i think the combinations you know we've seen al joe slow down throw one at a time throw that rangy kick i'm not gonna lie to you man if i, I think tj he looks like he's in great shape i don't want to make any jokes about what's happened to him in the past you know but for me stylistically if he can prevent the takedowns it's hard to imagine the value not, is not on him as an underdog 
Yeah, and so that, that, that just goes back to my, my initial thing, is that what do you think this line would be if this, this fight were happening three years ago and TJ Dillashaw had been active that in, th this entire time? It, it was coming off of an, act, like, an active campaign. You know, he was, he was at the peak of his career. What do you think that line would be? TJ Dillashaw would have probably been minus 250 minimum of what he was doing then before he popped for the EPO. He was just doing things that we haven't seen before. He was on a tear. He just kept getting better and better. He was so dominant. People couldn't figure him out between the footwork. And remember, he's also a guy that can wrestle. So if he feels like his striking is not working, he has the option to take it to the ground. Now here, this is going to be a strictly defensive wrestling mode, and he's going to want to keep this fight on the feet, which I think he can do. And I kind of like him here as the underdog. Yeah, all right. So he's, I mean, to say that TJ Dillashaw would have been minus 250 years ago, I mean, he's, he's still the same guy skills, skills wise. You just got to ask yourself, you know, with, with what he was, you know, putting into his body, what he was, what he was, uh, um, you know, found to have it in, in 2019 and now it's sort of a, a little bit of a layoff, one fight in the last three years. You just got to ask yourself, did that impact him so negatively? Because if you don't think it did, then you're getting a lot of value on TJ Dillashaw going from minus 250 all the way to plus 140. Okay, let's get to one a lot of people are interested in, man. Piotr Jan versus Sean O'Malley. You know all of the intrigue that's going into this fight, Ian. I don't really have to tee you up much on this one. We know the storylines. Is Sean O'Malley good enough to go in there and, and upset Piotr Jan? We don't know yet. You know, that last, that litmus test of Pedro Munoz didn't really tell us a whole lot other than when he fights higher level competition, Round one, he starts off slow. You got someone, Piotr Jan, who's a very slow starter as well. He's been fighting five round fights for the last few years. So it's, I'm gonna be interested to see how Piotr Jan also approaches this. You have someone in Sugar Sean O'Malley, who is a very lengthy guy. He's very talented. He's unpredictable with his striking, but he's got someone, Piotr Jan, who just is just unbelievably, he could be the champion tomorrow. There's no question there. I think it's a huge step up for Sean. I didn't like the way Sean approached the fight against Pedro. I think he felt like his popularity or just who he, his confidence should have gotten the win alone. He was losing that fight until the eye poke. He was starting to pick it up, but you can't fall behind against Piotr Jan. And if Piotr Jan gets off to a faster start than usual, I think Sean's gonna be in trouble here. I think Piotr Jan's gonna use those leg kicks. We know Sean doesn't do well with those. I think Piotr Jan's just better everywhere, unless somehow Sean can land a counter hook out of an exchange and drop him. I don't see it happening to me. It's the only way he gets the win. I think Piotr Jan's coming into this very hungry. Good win against Corey Sanhagen. He has an opportunity here to put that marketing pet of the UFC to bed for a little bit. He said it's a Connor wannabe. Don't know if I would go that far, but this fight's gonna go one of two ways. Either Sugar Sean goes into mega stardom or Piotr Jan's star shines a little bit brighter going into a title shot. Yeah, well, we were talking about Islam Makhachev being a favorite in every single one of his fights in the UFC. These two have been so as well. You've seen um, a lot of confidence in the betting market on both Piotr Jan and Sean O'Malley. What did you think of the line? Minus 270 for Piotr Jan. Is that too high or is that within a realm that you'd be, you'd be comfortable to play it? You know, to me, I'm comfortable putting it, playing it in a parlay. You know me, I don't like going over minus 200 or slightly above it on a straight play just because it's a lot of juice to lay and anything could happen. It is mixed martial arts. But the line makes a lot of sense. I think they've kind of put the odds out there correctly based on the body of work from Piotr Jan and who Sean has fought. Levels of competition are way far apart. Jan's been with the elite for a while. Sean's trying to break through. This is a tall task for him, but I understand the matchup for the UFC. They're getting a guy who wants to strike first and not wrestle, but Jan can wrestle. We'll see if he does it. Yeah. All right, let's go to the lightweight division. Benil Dariush versus Mateus Gamrot. And I got to say, man, obviously there are a lot of great storylines on this card. This is also one of them because Benil Dariush, man, uh, the guy just cannot catch a break. He was supposed to fight Islam Makachev. He injured his leg, uh, had to pull out of that fight. And now he's getting a, a guy who is really dangerous, a guy who, uh, you know, we know how good this guy is. The casual fans do not. So it's a very risky fight for Dariush in terms of losing his spot in the division. And the odds makers think that's going to happen. Gamrot minus 200. Dariush coming back at plus 170. What do you make of Dariush at plus 170 against a guy in Gamrot who has not fought that level of competition yet? You know what? If this was a year ago, uh, I would say fire away at Benil Dariush. You know? But you got a guy in Matush Gamrot who is flying high, riding a great win over Armand Saruki, and again, close on the scorecards, but he's just extremely well-rounded. He's got a great camp behind him, good striking, good wrestling. He's got insane cardio, you know, and he just doesn't seem to really, uh, he's got some pretty solid durability, let's call it that. He's able to recover quickly, and we haven't seen that as much with Benil Dariush. We've seen Dariush knocked out. We saw in the fight with Jakar close, he was able to come back and get that knockout, but he was on skates too, he got a little careless. I just think this is a, 
to your point, a weird or bizarre matchup for someone that was going to fight Islam, and now he's fighting someone, Gamrod, who's not necessarily well known to the casual fan. But I think after this fight, everyone's going to know who he is. I think he's going to call for a title shot when he gets the win. That doesn't mean that Dariush can't get this done. I think Dariush is extremely talented. When you're coming off a knee injury and you're fighting a guy who's extremely mobile, very active, moves around a ton, I think it's going to be a challenge for him. I like Gamrot in this fight. Yep, yep. Win or lose, a lot of, uh, a lot of I think, interesting fights still in, in Gamrot's future. But, Neil, this is a big one. This is a big one for him. It's a, him, it's a must win. I, you got to give, give him respect for even taking this fight. We'll see how it goes, a three-rounder on the pay-per-view. Okay, let's close out the pay-per-view. you got Caitlin Chukagan taking on Manon Fior. Um, Fior has, has been obviously very, very, very impressive. So has Chukagan. It has taken the best of the best to beat Caitlin Chukagan. She did miss weight this week, and she comes in at a plus 175 underdog. What do we think of this matchup at 125 pounds, Ian? You know what? For me, this is going to be dog or pass here. Madden Fiore has, has looked good. Her striking, we all know this, is, is excellent. She's probably, I mean, she's easily one of the top three strikers in the division. But she hasn't fought someone size-wise like Caitlin. Hasn't fought someone with that type of striking, but who also possesses an excellent ground game. You know, we know Caitlin... You know, it's death taxes and Chukagian winning by decision is like the automatic thing on planet Earth, right? We know that in life. But for Madden Fiore, she's going to have to come forward and win early rounds because Chukagian knows how to steal those early. She's got a good jab. She keeps her distance. She doesn't really get hit much. And I wouldn't be surprised if she shot in early because if she puts Madden Fiore on her back, Chukagian wins that fight. And you know what? I'm going to take a stab here at the underdog at plus 175. I think Chukagian relies on the grappling, gets it done here. I like that, man. Dogger pass. Caitlin Jukagian, you know, often talk about the disrespect that's thrown towards Charles Oliveira's way. I feel like Caitlin Jukagian gets some disrespect in some, in some of these betting odds because she has been nothing but consistent her entire UFC career. Okay, let's go to one prelim, a featured prelim. It's at the welterweight division. Bilal Muhammad, who, let's be honest, didn't really want to fight Sean Brady. He had his eyes on some bigger things. He does fight down in rank right now. He's trying to defend his spot against a guy who's been very impressive in Sean Brady. Very, very tight fight. Um, at odds makers have it. They actually have Sean Brady as a favorite. Minus 140, Bilal Muhammad plus 120. What do you think here? Do you like the underdog here, or are we going with Sean Brady as a small favorite? <laughs> I mean, look, Bilal's a friend of mine, so I don't want to be biased here. You know, the only thing I will say is I think Bilal looked fantastic against Luque. I think he fought a very smart fight. He's fighting a guy in here, Sean Brady, who's an absolute powerhouse. You heard it from Michael Chiesa. This guy is just physically super strong. Now, the one thing I noticed in that fight, though, Sean Brady's hands did not look great. Chiesa is not known for his striking, was winning on the feet, and then Brady forced it to go to the ground. If Bilal can keep this fight standing, I truly believe he's got the better striking, and I think he can get it done. Now, for me, if you are willing to pay the juice on this fight, I think there's no question this fight's going three rounds. I would say this fight's going to go the distance, but for me, you take away the relationships, you take away the emotions of this fight. I think Bilal is a very smart fighter. He's got a Khabib in his corner. You know, he said the vibe is different. It's just so intense, and it's so just... He's seeing everything from a different lens. He also looked huge at the face-off compared to Brady. I would take a stab at Bilal, plus 120. He's fought a higher-level competition, and he knows what he's got to do here to get it done. All right, yeah, very important fight at welterweight. Okay, uh, there, there are more prelims to talk about besides just the featured one. There's actually a pretty good long list of prelims. You can catch them on ESPN+, Plus, and you can catch Ian's prelim picks right here. What do you got for us, Ian? Balala plus 120. We're going to go Murdov Barajo. Over one and a half rounds for Chow. Last two fights have gone to decision for Murdov. Two out of the three have gone to the third round. He was subbed by GM3 at the end of round two. I like Karlov here over Uzdemir. Look, Uzdemir did what he needed to do against Paul Craig, but it wasn't impressive. He got tired, and Karlov ran through Alexander Gustafsson. I think he does the same thing here. Nurmagomedov over Gadzi. Listen, that's going to be a really tight fight for Nurmagomedov. If he can maintain top position, which I think he can, he gets the win. Armand Petrosian, this guy has been quietly very impressive for the UFC, and Dobson is wrestle or, or nothing. And if he can't get this fight to the floor, Petrosian pieces him up. Minus 220 is a heavy price. You can throw him in a parlay. I like him to get it done. Mahan Makayev, another guy we're talking about. Prospect, blue chip, top notch. He gets it done inside the distance. I actually don't mind that number, believe it or not. Last but not least, Rosa over Landsberg. I say Rosa by decision. We get the number from minus three and change to minus 120. Well, we came close to hitting it last week. How about a parlay, Ian, for UFC 280? Yeah, let's do it. We were so close last week. Again, if you get to that last leg, 
hedge, be profitable, or break even. We're gonna go Piotr Jan as our anchor here at minus 265. I just don't see him losing this fight. Bilal Muhammad, Sean Brady, fight to start round three. You're gonna pay a lot, but that's why we put it in the parlay. Look, Muhammad Makai, the minus 1150 is ridiculously high, but in a parlay, at least we get a little action on the guy. And Cal Rosa at minus 330. As long as she doesn't get hugged against the cage by Lena for three rounds, she's the better fighter. Not the sexiest parlay at plus 149, but you get four favorites. We're gonna put them together and let's get the win. Yeah, not the sexiest one, but those are some some big time favorites and hopefully we get it done, hit four of them and get out with some plus money. All right, how about best bets? You know, best bets this week, it, it's a little bit chalky here. So, but we try to find the value and this is what I'm going with. I am gonna go with Islam Mahachev. I think he gets it done. We're going there. She, Piotr Jan, Sean O'Malley, fight to go the distance. Again, just these guys, the durability from both guys. And it just Piotr Jan just hasn't been finishing people. I think Sugar Sean's gonna be a little hesitant in that approach. Murda Barajo, over one and a half. Nikita Krylov, money line minus 170 over Volkan Uzdemir. Last but not least, I'm gonna lay the juice at minus 225. I am not confident in Mohamed Mokayev. I think he gets it done here inside the distance. All right, so a little bit chalky on the best bets, but hey man, I want you to pick, pick the fights that you are uh, confident in. I never want you to force the underdog, so a little bit of chalk on the best bets, but I can tell you what not will not be chalky, and that is the next segment of the show, the long shot parlay, which I would remind everybody did hit a couple weeks ago. What do you got? <laughs> yeah, you know, originally it started off as a three-leg parlay. It got shot down to two. The Almeida fights off, unfortunately. I really did like him as an underdog. So we're gonna go TJ Dillashaw and Caitlin Chukagian. We're still getting a plus 580 on this number. So I, technically it's still a long shot. You got two underdogs here. I do like this putting them together. So we're gonna put them in, get a plus 580 number, and that's gonna be our long shot for the week. All right, not exactly a plus uh, 3,800 as we hit a couple weeks ago, but we will take it, a plus 500. You only need two legs to get it done on the long shot parlay. All right, that wraps up, wraps up UFC. Best bets for UFC 280. It is going to be a heck of a night. Make some plays, win some money, and enjoy the fights from Abu Dhabi. We will see you next week for another card.